Okay, so now uh, for the second part, we're going to uh, lighten things up a bit and go to lazy learning where we can take things easy. Uh, and the idea, uh, I'm going to give a, a few examples, but the idea of lazy learning is that we don't really have a learning step. We are not trying to find parameters for, for the model. So, so far, we've been looking at eager learning, which uh, is an approach where you represent the hypothesis class with some model that has parameters, and you find the best parameters, uh, and thus find the best hypothesis. When you do that, you need to have a training stage where you do all the computations, minimize some target function and so on. You get the best parameters and now you don't need your data anymore because you already have the hypothesis, it's fully parameterized and you can use that to classify anything. You don't need to keep the data. So this is eager learning. You get the answers then based on the model, trained on the trained model, so on your hypothesis uh, that you obtain. With lazy learning, you don't have a training step. So basically what you do is, you don't really have a model to represent the hypothesis class. The hypothesis class is there somewhere in abstract, but you don't have a model to represent it with parameters. And you don't do any training, you just store the data. When you need to answer some questions about new data points, you look up the data that you have and answer based on that data. So let's see an example with this classifier, k nearest neighbors. This is a, a very simple to understand. You keep all the training sets. You don't do any training. So someone gives you a training step, a set, you just store it. And when someone asks you what is the class of a new point, you look at the nearest k examples in your data set, which is labeled, and you output the majority vote of those examples. So this is an example of lazy learning. We don't have a model representing the hypothesis class. We don't do any training. We don't compute parameters for that model. We just store the initial data set that has all the labels and then answer depending on the neighborhood of what we have. <coughs> if we use k nearest neighbors with k equals one, this means that we store a data set and we answer any questions about future points based on the closest neighbors. This results on what's called the Voronoi tessellation, which is this tessellation that separates different points with a straight line or a hyperplane in higher dimensions that is at the mid point between the two. So equidistant from these two points, there is this line separating them, equidistant from uh, uh, these two, there is this line, and so forth. So we get this tessellation, these are the regions with k equals 1, where we assign the different classes. So if a point falls here, for example, the closest neighbor is this one, so it's red. If it falls here, the closest neighbor is this one, it's blue. This is how we do classification. So this is lazy learning because we are not training anything, we just store this set of data points, this set of examples, and for every new classification, we look up the closest neighbor and choose that. We can use higher values of, of k. Then we get things that are more complicated, but in this case, for example, we are using the three nearest neighbors to decide which is the class. So if one point falls here, for example, it's close to that blue one, but it's also close to two red ones. These are the three nearest neighbors. So this is the red point, this is the red point here too. If it falls on this side, now it has blue neighbors and it's a blue point. So this. Uh, separation becomes a bit more complicated. Those regions I represent there are where different sets of neighbors are the closest three, but uh, you see the same kind of pattern for these decisions. This is the same thing but with five closest neighbors. And basically, regardless of how many neighbors you use, the decision boundary is always piecewise linear. So it's not a straight line, but it's a set of straight lines with some corners because it's always a matter of which neighbors are closest to uh, the points that you're trying to classify. So this is k nearest neighbors. Uh, uh, if you use a higher value of k, for example, k equals to 25, the decision boundary is less sensitive to local uh, uh, conditions and looks further afield. So in this case, each point is classified by using the majority vote of the 25 nearest neighbors around it. 
If you use a small value, for example, k equals 1, it will only look locally for the label, and so you get something that is a lot more uh, uh, curvy uh, and uh, fits uh, your training data better. It may not generalize that fast. The lines are the frontier where you go from blue to red. So this is the discriminant. If you fall on this side, the nearest neighbor is blue, so it's a blue point. All points here in this region are blue. If you step to the other side of the line, then the nearest neighbor is a red point, and all these parts are red. So this line is the discriminant between the blue class and the red class. For example, on the previous Yes. Okay, so this, this is not the discriminant. These lines, I, I, I just put them there for the regions where you have different sets of points as the nearest neighbor. So in this region, there are three nearest neighbors, which are these three, okay? Uh, but it's still blue because most two of them are blue. When you go here, then you have other three as nearest neighbors. When you go here, there are other three and so on. So all those regions, they have different sets of neighbors, but the color depends on the majority here. Here I'm simplifying and I'm just showing the frontier between the two classes, okay? So, but as you go, if you move around here, the, neighbor, the nearest neighbors are changing. But they're all blue, so it doesn't make a difference for the class, okay? <coughs> so to implement a K nearest neighbor classifier, we need to have a distance function. Because we need to compute which is the closest neighbor, we need to compute the distance. If you have categorical data, uh, things that are, for example, true or false, young or old, something like that, then you cannot really measure distance like in Euclidean space, but you can use something like Hamming distance. So basically, the, the distance is the sum of the differences between your, your vectors with categorical features. If you have... Yeah. Well, there are some advantages. There is, that is a good question, but there, there is one theorem in machine learning, which is the no-free lunch theorem. If you take any classifier and apply it to all theoretically possible sets of data, all classifiers will perform exactly the same, and exactly the same as tossing a coin. Because if you are biasing your, your hypothesis class to some kind of data, because it works better there, there is some other type of data where things don't work. Of course, reality doesn't span all the possible uh, examples of data, so in practice some things tend to work better than, than others. But mostly there are some advantages and disadvantages from the start depending on the kind of data that you have. One obvious advantage here is that, for example, it's hard to use uh, logistic regression if you have categorical data because then it doesn't make sense to do those products and here is, as long as you can compute the distance you can use uh, k-nearest neighbors. There's also the, the problem of computation you don't need to compute things uh, before because you don't have a training uh, uh, a training stage but overall the, the issue is that uh, um, you must choose the algorithm that works best for the kind of data that you're dealing with. So for continuous value, uh, you can use Minkowski distance or P norm. This is in the general expression, is the P root of the sum of the uh, uh, norm of the dis differences between the two vectors, uh, vector uh, this x and x line, raised to P. This is just a, a generic expression, but you have some examples that are widely used. For example, Euclidean distance is Minkowski distance with p equal to 2. So this is the square root of the difference is squared. You don't need the norm because of the square, but you could have the, the models there too. Uh, if you use p equal to 1, you have Manhattan distance, which is just the, the sum of the models of the, the difference. <coughs> and you see how this affects the the shape of these uh, frontiers. This would be P equal to, so Euclidean distance in this case. This would be with Manhattan distance, so you're just you're measuring distance on the vertical and horizontal. Right? This could be something strange, for example P equals 0.7, you get some weird uh, 
results there. But in theory, you could use any value there. The useful ones are, are generally Manhattan and Euclidean distances, or that is p equal 1 or p equal 2. There may be some applications where you can use different values, but this is a more generic uh, formula for distance. OK, so how could we implement this? We can create a function for computing the distance between one point and a set of points. So small x is one vector, large x is a, a matrix with uh, lots of vectors on the row. Uh, and then there is p there. And if you put an equal sign inside the, the parameters on a Python function, you can set the default value. This means that if you call this function with two arguments, p will be assumed to be 2. Only if you add the third argument, then you can change p to another value. So we can compute the square of the differences between the two by subtracting from the matrix with all the points, x, the points that we have there. And this is something that you can do with NumPy arrays because they align from the uh, uh, last dimension first. So suppose that these are three-dimensional points. x will be a, a vector of three values. And X, uh, capital X, will be a matrix with three columns and N rows for N points. Since the last dimension of capital X is three, which is the, the columns, and the last dimension of my small X is three because it's the only dimension it has, the, this operation will be done row by row, aligning the, the, this vector with each row of the original matrix. So you can do this in one single go, you get a matrix with all these di differences. You can compute the models of all the differences and then raise these to the power of p. Okay. So now you can also sum everything according to uh, this direction. This x is 1. So you're summing everything across the rows. And you get the distances for all the points in capital X. So basically, you can do this without loops by just using the, the NumPy array. Now we can uh, compute the nearest k neighbors of some point to all the data set that we have stored. So this uh, large X, capital X, can be uh, the training set that we start. And now for each point we want to classify, we just compute the distance to all the others and get the k nearest neighbors. So basically, we get the vector with all the distances. We use arc sort that gives us the indexes of the vectors that will sort this uh, in a descending, uh, in an ascending order. So smallest one, second smallest one, and so forth. And we take the k first indexes. So these are the the indexes of the k nearest neighbor. And now we can classify by looking at the indexes of the k nearest neighbors and looking at the modes of the class labels there. So the mode is the most common value in the class label. There is a little detail here. <coughs> Those two zeros there are because the mode function uh, from SciPy stats returns a tuple of two arrays. One array has all the modes, and the other array has the count of how many times these values of the mode occur. So we want from the first array, which is the array of modes, the first value, which is the, the largest, the, the actual mode, the, the most common value. And that's why there are the two zeros there. But you don't need to memorize this. Uh, the idea of this code is just to give you an outline of the implementation, to show you how you can do this in Python with just a few lines of code, and also for you to have an idea of what you can do. When you're actually writing this code, you should look up the documentation, see the examples and so on, because it's uh, it's not useful to try to memorize uh, all these details. So this is basically k nearest neighbor. We need a distance. We need to find the k nearest points to any example that we give. And now we look at the labels for those k nearest points and output the label of the majority of them. Uh, so the question now is when we do this, should we do rescaling, like standardizing and normalizing and so on? Uh, here it's a bit different because we are using distances. So suppose that you have features that are age, weight, height. So you have years, kilograms, and, and meters. In that case, you should standardize because 
it doesn't make sense that you measure a distance by adding the kilograms and the years and so on because they're all different scales. But suppose that you have uh, one feature that is meters, another feature that is meters to the west, another feature that is meters down or something like that, and they're all in the same scale. Now you should not rescale them independently because you start distorting those distance measures. Uh, so basically the answer in this case, when you use anything that depends on distance, you need to think about what are the actual features that you're using. If they are completely different scales, then you should try to approximate everything to between 0 and 1 so that they have the same weight on the final result. But if they have the same units, then you should think if it makes sense to change the scale of one relative to the other so that they no longer have the same unit. Okay? So this becomes a bit trickier and it depends on the actual problem. So in general, if the features are all different things, you should use either standardization or normalization. If the features have the same units, you have to think about what you're doing because you may be distorting the, the data. <coughs> so now, let's uh, find the best k. We can load uh, a data set. We set aside one third of the data for testing. And now let's do cross-validation to try to find the best value of k. So we're going to test different values of k. We're going to use only odd values because this is a binary classification and uh, it's not useful to use k equal 2 or 4 or something like that because we can have a tie. And if we have a tie, we don't know which class to assign to. But if you have a binary classification and you use k equals 1, 3, 5 or something like that, then you never have a tie. There will always be one class that is uh, larger than the other. Uh, so, we are, we are going to plot the training error, the, the cross-validation error, and the test error. But we are not going to use the test error. So this is, one, this is just to show you an example. Uh, we have the training error here in blue, the cross-validation error here in red, and the, the test error here. It's not a problem to plot the test error. Each of these points is an unbiased estimate of the true error. The thing that we cannot do is use the test error to choose the, the best model. Because if we use the test error, then it's no longer a test error. It's a validation error because now it's biased. Okay? So, we're going to use the cross-validation error to choose the best model. And we see that the, the error starts going down, then it stabilizes here and starts going up a bit uh, over there. So we can choose something like this. I think it's 9, it's the, the minimum there. Uh, but if you look at the test error, actually it's about 6 or 7. Uh, it's 7, the, the minimum. But we are not going to use the test error to choose the best model, because then we are going to bias the, the estimates on the test error. Okay? So it's not a problem if you plot the test error. Just don't fall into the temptation of using that one, because then you'll be left without an unbiased estimate of the true error. One thing also to note is that when we use k equals 1, we have a training error of 0. This is generally the case because unless you have two points that are exactly coincident and have different classes, when you use k equals 1 on the training set, the nearest neighbor of any point in the training set is that point itself. So the error will always be 0 because it will always find the correct uh, class for that point. Okay? Note, however, that this is, has a lot of overfitting because when you look just at the closest point, you get a, a, a cross-validation error that is uh, very, uh, relatively large because there are some uh, mixed, mixed points there and looking just at the closest one is not a good idea in this case. <coughs> so using k equals 9, we get this frontier between the two of them, and now we can use the test set to uh, get an estimate of the, the true error. Now one problem with using dimensions is this uh, curse, uh, sorry, problem of using distances is the curse of dimensionality. I imagine that we have a, a one-dimensional problem, so we have a line, and the, the frontier we consider to be 5% region on uh, either side. So we are uh, looking at the region on the edge of our uh, uh, class, for example, that occupies 5% in the one dimension. If you go to two dimensions, we have a ring that has 5% of the diameter, and the area of that ring is now larger than 5%. It's around 10%, because in two dimensions, 
the outer ring of the circle will have the largest uh, area. If you go to three dimensions, the, the volume of that shell is now 14%. Even though the shell is only 5% of the diameter, the, sh the volume of the shell is 14%. And as you increase the number of dimensions, so in four dimensions we can no longer imagine it, but this keeps on increasing. So, for example, if you have a 5% uh, frontier, if the frontier is 5% of the distance, then when you go, for example, to six dimensions, you're already occupying 30% uh, of the volume. If you go to around 20 dimensions, you get 70% of the volume. So if you have many features, the edge of your classes is mostly everything. And since the edge is where the frontier is at, you start having problems distinguishing between the groups. So this is the curse of dimensionality. Many dimensions, distance methods start uh, working poorly because when you're looking, uh, trying to look at the frontier and see if it falls closer to one side or the other, this uh, frontier now becomes most of the, the region you have to consider. We can also do lazy learning with regression. So this is uh, K nearest neighbors used for regression, where instead of trying to estimate the class label, we are looking at the nearest, labels, uh, nearest neighbors and averaging the target value. So this would be uh, k nearest neighbors regression with k equals 1, we assign the blue line, uh, the value on the y-axis is the value of the closest neighbor. If we increase k, we can use, for example, k11, we are looking at the average of the 11 nearest neighbors and we get uh, a somewhat smoother line. Still, since as we uh, move along the x-axis, the neighbors change discontinuously. So there is one region here where we have these 11 nearest neighbors and then suddenly one of them disappears, another one becomes part of the neighborhood and we have a jump there. So we have this stair staircase-like loop to the line because the neighborhood changes discontinuously. Uh, this is one problem with k nearest neighbor regression that we can solve if we give different weights to the different points depending on the distance. Uh, and so we can do kernel regression, which is using a kernel function. In this uh, context, a kernel function is just a, kernel, uh, a function that is not negative, so all the values of the function are zero or more. The area of the function over all the x domains uh, is one, and the function is symmetric uh, at zero. So the values for x are the same as uh, the, the values for minus x. Some examples of kernel functions can be, uh, for example, a triangle, uh, a Gaussian curve, the cosine, uh, a uniform distribution like this. So, so as long as it's symmetrical here from one side to the other, the total area is one and everything is positive, you can use that as a kernel function. And the purpose of the kernel function here is to give different weights to the points the more further away they are. So if they are further away, the weight uh, reduces. If they are closer together, they have uh, larger way. So what we can do for kernel regression, for example, let's use a Gaussian kernel. We use this Gaussian curve as the, the kernel function. And now we need to use this function to compute for each point in our regression. So for example, for each point along this line, how we're going to weigh the different points that we have in our data set. So for this, we need an estimator. There are uh, many of them, but this is just one of the simplest ones, the Nazaria Watson estimator, is just a weighted average where we compute the weighted average of the y values of the points we have in our data set by giving to each one a weight that is the kernel function divided with the distance between uh, the, the x values of the points. So if we are uh, if we are using this point here at this x value, we consider this distance between the, the x values. We use that for the kernel fu function with this uh, h parameter so that we can fine tune whether we consider, we give more weight to the points that are close together or farther apart. And this is just the average, the, uh, the weighted average. So each of these uh, kernel values um, functions as a weight and we divide by the sum of them. There are other more complex estimators. For example, this Priestley Chow uses also the distance between each point and the previous one. This is useful when you have a series of points that has an order uh, and it gives different weights depending on how far apart 
the points are along the sequence, and so on. There are uh, many different estimators. But let's just use this one as an example. Um, we have this Gaussian function. We input u and we return the value of the Gaussian curve. So this formula here. Uh, and then either I watch an estimator, we uh, will receive the, this k is the kernel function that we're going to use. So in Python, you can assign variables to functions. Functions are just objects like everything else, only they can be uh, executed. So you can use k and send you as parameters and uh, call this function like this. So this is the kernel function. The age is this uh, uh, scaling factor here. So if age is very large, the distances will all shrink because we are dividing by age and we will consider points that are farther apart as if they were closer together. If age is small, the distances will be larger and we will consider them as large. So basically, age large is the same as using a broad kernel and age small, a narrower kernel. And now we just sum uh, everything here and then divide by that denominator, so basically this loop is, do is doing these sums here. So this is the result. We have this set of data, these points, and now we use H to uh, use uh, broaden or narrow the, the kernel. If the kernel is very narrow, we are giving all the weight to points that are close to the ones we are evaluating and almost ignoring everything else. So with a very narrow kernel or a small edge, our curve is very jagged and, and passes closely to the point. When we use a larger var a value of edge, then we are effectively using a broader, as if we were using a broader kernel. So we are averaging the weight of the s all the points in the neighborhood and our line becomes smoother. And we can do this as a form of, of uh, regularization, for example. Uh, note that this is lazy learning. The curve here depends on the data points that we have, and we do not have an explicit model for the curve. We are computing everything by weighting the, uh, the different contributions of the points. We have one parameter that we can fit, but H alone does not give us the curve. It depends on the data. So this is lazy learning and, non and a non-parametric model. We, we don't have an explicit model for that curve. Okay? <coughs> Another thing we can do, now in this case it's unsupervised learning, we're going to deal more with that later on, but uh, uh, another thing we can do with kernels is to do density estimation. So suppose that we have these points here, these crosses, uh, they are more densely distributed there than here, and one common way of representing this distribution is to use a histogram. So probably everyone used histograms. Uh, the problem with histograms is that depending on the size of the, of the bin. For example, if we use smaller bins, like this green one, we have this shape like this. If we use larger bins, then we have larger counts, and we have the yellow one there. And uh, depending on the size of the bin, the shape of the histogram can vary quite a lot, because each bar uh, is just the number of points that fell in that interval, and this varies discontinuously. So we can do it better, represent distributions and, and estimate distributions better if we use uh, kernels. So this is kernel density estimation. This, in this case, we have a Gaussian kernel. We are going to assign to each point a Gaussian curve, and we're going to sum all the contributions. So we get this curve here. We have a smoother uh, representation of this distribution. It doesn't have those discontinuities. We still need to uh, determine the width of the kernel, so the shape of those Gaussians. We can parameterize that, but we have better, uh, a better estimate of the distribution. Since this is a kernel function and the integral is 1, if we divide this area by the number of points, we get something that has an area of 1, and it can serve as a probability distribution estimate. So, usually we use this kernel density to estimate probability distributions based on a set of data. You can do this with scikit-learn by using the kernel density uh, class. Uh, you can specify the kernel, for example, a Gaussian kernel. And then when you do fit, uh, it actually doesn't do anything. It just stores the data. This is another example of lazy learning. When you compute score samples, so you add, you send uh, some input values, x values, it will then compute on those points these values by adding the contribution of the, the kernel. 
Note, however, that the, the result of SCAR samples is the logarithm of that uh, probability density estimate, because um, uh, not only because usually those probabilities are very small, and if you don't use logarithms, you can get uh, an underflow uh, on the, the floating points, but also if you're trying to combine probabilities, you need to multiply them, and it's easier to sum the, the logarithms. But we're going to see this better next week when you look at, at nice base uh, classifiers using this. Okay. So to summarize, uh, we saw this dif difference between lazy learning and eager learning. All these were examples of lazy learning because there is no model that, that we need to parameterize. We just store the data and compute things at query time. Uh, k nearest neighbors, we can use them for regression or classification. Uh, remember that all these methods based on distance tend to perform, perform poorly when you have lots of features because of the curse of dimensionality. The frontier, uh, when you compute the distance, becomes uh, a greater part of the region. Uh, and we also saw the use of kernel functions for regression and density estimation. So there are some, some sections that you can read for this.